Hi everybody, welcome to lecture 4.3, where we'll continue our conversation about complex societies in the old world and focus in today on the development of writing in particular and using a case study of ancient China to compare to our discussion of Mesopotamian Indus River Valley and Southeast Asian civilizations in our previous modules. So let's get into it. We have early evidence for writing around 2500 BC in China. This evidence is associated with divination rituals and comes from the site of Shangzia. At Shangzia, we have evidence found of writing in dozens of cracked oxen shoulder blades. These bones are identified as oracle bones and were used in divination ceremonies. What people did was to use the shoulder blades of oxen or bison, as well as tortoise shells, particularly scapula bones. And these bones were part of a kind of ritual process intended to be able to predict the future called scapulomancy. So basically, scapulomancy involved a series of steps in which the bones or shells were smoothed, cleaned, and then soaked in liquid. Small holes were then made in the underside of the bones. A diviner would pose a question to the spiritual world by applying a metal heated metal point to the hollows of the bones. Fissures would then appear on the bone's surface. The diviner would then interpret those fissures as messages from the ancestors. The diviner could control the extent and direction of the crack. These divinations provided authoritative priests with useful ways of giving advice to royal consorts. So you may be thinking, what does scapulomancy and divination have to do with writing? Well, no written inscriptions accompany these oracle bones at Shangzia, but they have found written inscriptions elsewhere associated with similar types of oracle bones. Scholars suggest that Chinese writing originated from the need to interpret the fissures and cracks that appeared on oracle bones. New writing symbols actually began to resemble the crack patterns that we see at oracle bones found at sites like Shangzia. Clearly, some Chinese ideographs originated as what's called pictographs. For example, the word for hill, originally shown as three kind of humped lines, is now written in modern Chinese as a horizontal line with three vertical strokes. Divination and ritual played a vital part of village governmental structures. All official divination addressed to the was addressed to the royal ancestor, and diviners served as kind of critical intermediaries between the living and the ultimate divine ancestor, referred to as Shang Di. Shang Di was a deity who served as the kind of original progenitor, the original ancestor of the royal line. The ruler was considered the head of all family lines. And so you actually have this kind of kinship structure that is linked into the cosmology of ancient China, which creates a hierarchy of rules. This kind of hierarchy of ruling obligated peasants to provide food and labor for their divine rulers. So you can see in ancient China, there's this kind of intersection between rituals, divination, religion, and the development of writing and hierarchy. So let's talk a little bit about what these early Chinese civilizations actually look like. 
the first large-scale civilization in northern China that we have archaeological evidence for is called the Shang Dynasty. It was founded by King Tan following the Battle of Mintagaitao. Evidence from oracle bones informs us that the Shang rulers of China lived in at least seven different capitals situated within the modern province of Henan, Shandong, and Anhui. Shang rulers buried their dead in cemeteries close to Anyan. The Shang king is surrounded in a sepulchral full of hundreds of lesser burials. We also see chambers that contain superb bronze vessels and ornaments, elaborate burial objects associated with these elite rulers. Excavations of Shang sites in the 1970s have revealed that most of the graves associated with these royal burials contain decapitated or dismembered bodies, something that we also talked about when we looked at Mesopotamian early cities. So it's hypothesized by archeologists that these victims were actually sacrificial offerings given to this, the divine ruler of the Shang dynasty following his death. In addition to these kind of elaborate royal burials, during the Shang dynasty, which lasts from about 1760 to about 1046 BC, we also see the development of intricate art styles, especially elaborate bronze objects. Bronze working was controlled by rulers and used almost exclusively for the production of food and drinking vessels. These vessels were decorated with dragons, birds, and geometric patterns. During the Shang Dynasty, we also see the development of a sophisticated standing army. Soldiers were actually conscripted to serve and were equipped with a kind of standardized set of weapons, which included bows and arrows, shields, small knives, and sharpening stones. Despite the fact that the Shang Dynasty had a formidable standing army during the 11th century BC, the dynasty actually began to fray along its peripheries as formerly conquered states and regions sought independence. The last Shang king also neglected his duties and used torture on citizens, so he didn't have a strong base of support even within the capital and central part of the empire. These factors were kind of came to a head in a military defeat by King Wu of the Zhao province in the Battle of Moi, Moi Wai in 1046 BC. The citizens of the Shang Dynasty offered little resistance to King Wu as he marched into the central capital of the Shang Dynasty. The Shang King retreated into his palace and committed suicide by setting the building on fire. Following this, these series of events, Wu established the Zhao Dynasty, which was the longest lasting dynasty of ancient China. The Zhao Dynasty was based on what's referred to as the feudal system in which the emperor was positioned at the top of a hierarchical social system and was considered the divine son of God. Underneath the emperor were lords and lords of local city-states who were given military and political control over surrounding farming villages. The commoners who lived in these villages neither possessed any power nor any land, and they were totally in the hands of the kings and nobles. This kind of lower class category within the feudal system can be divided into peasants who rented lands from nobles and in return were expected to have some kind of special service to this royalty 
artisans who were men who did not take land on rent but opted to work like doing tasks like blacksmithing, carpentry, or bronze work. Servants, who were the people who worked in the houses and on the lands of nobles, as well as slaves, people who were made slaves primarily in wars or were bought to serve for their entire life without getting any compensation. The Zhao dynasty ushered in an important period of intellectual and artistic awakening that built on the development of writing and bronze working during the Shang dynasty. For example, during the Zhao dynasty, we see the emergence of important philosophical schools of thought, including Taoism, legalism, which we'll talk about in a bit, as well as Confucianism. Confucianism, in particular, came to play an important role in shaping Chinese political thought up until the present day. Confucianism, in particular, is attributed to the philosopher Confucius, who originally conceptualized this philosophy as a kind of set of political and moral doctrines that focused on everyday concerns, as well as as opposed to kind of abstract existential thoughts about the afterworld. Confucius really, Confucianism really became a dominant political ideology in China during the Han Dynasty, which began a, around 200 BC. So some of the key features of Confucianism are the need for benevolent and frugal rulers. Confucius also stressed the importance of finding inner moral harmony and challenged the idea that some men are born superior to others. He also argued that being morally superior actually had nothing to do with who you were born or your, or your biology, but was in fact a matter of character and personal development. While the Zhao dynasty introduced a new kind of hierarchical social system in the form of feudalism and a new set of kind of religious and political beliefs in the form of Confucianism, its control of its vast empire eventually frayed during the 5th century BC as regional leaders ignored their duties to the Zhao court and began fighting among themselves. These mounting internal tensions were made worse by non-Chinese aggressors who began to penetrate the borders of the empire. The period between 476 and roughly 221 BC is referred to as the Warring State Period, in which seven states contended for control of what was then the Zhao Dynasty. This period of intense warfare came to a close in 221 BC, when China was unified once again by an emperor Ying Zhang from the small state in the far west of China called Qing. Qing were semi-nomadic horse breeders who ended up controlling about a third of all the land under cultivation and a third of the total population of this area of China. The Qing Dynasty had a short duration, but was marked, but had an important mark on Chinese civilization. While the Zhao Dynasty has followed followed the principles of Confucianism, the Qing Dynasty was structured around legalism, which was based on the idea that humans were wayward by nature and needed regulations. As part of legalism, there was a widespread abolition of the aristocracy, that upper class in the feudal system of the Zhao dynasty, who and an institution of positions based on merit. We also see that scholarship during this time, ironically, was strongly suppressed and literacy was denied to the majority of the population. The belief here was that uneducated people were actually easier to control. 
During the Qing Dynasty, like what we see in other places in Mesopotamia in the Indus, and in the Indus River Valley, we see the development of standardized forms of weights and measures, as well as the standardization of education, all of which were controlled by the central ruler. In particular, during the Qing Dynasty, we see the introduction of a single currency, which was called the Ban Liang coin, shown behind me here. One of the most important artistic contributions that occurred during the short period of the Qing Dynasty was the simplification and standardization of written Chinese. So you can see behind me the kind of evolution of the Chinese writing system from the early development of oracle bones during the Shang Dynasty into kind of seals um, during the Zhao Dynasty and then during the Qing Dynasty, a kind of uh, formalization of modern Chinese writing systems which continues into today. The other fascinating part of the Qing Dynasty, which has an ongoing legacy today in China, was the construction of the Great Wall. So the first, the, em the Qing Emperor was the first to begin constructing this Great Wall of China to protect his lands from invaders to the north. And that's me in the picture walking on the Great Wall of China. So this wall was built along the northern border of the empire to defend against nomadic groups like the Shangju and Mongols. These, the wall itself was constructed by cons conscripts and convicts. The wall was, com the Great Wall was completed during the Ming Dynasty, which ran from about 1368 to 1664 CE. So it took over a thousand years to construct the massive structure that now exists as the Great Wall of China. Ying Zhang, the emperor of the Qing Dynasty, in addition to constructing this massive wall along the borders of the empire, also constructed a massive monumental tomb to secure his place in the afterlife. Zhang was notorious for having this fear of being assassinated and became obsessed with death and eternal life. Prior to his death in 210 BC, Zhang ordered the construction of an elaborate tomb complex near modern day Xi'an. He it, this complex was constructed by 700,000 laborers over a period of roughly 30 years. The palace complex that these workers built stands at about 35 to by 60 square kilometers. Zhang's body was, deter was interred in a three stepped pyramid standing 60 meters high, which was surrounded by a double wall. The tomb itself was said to contain replicas of the region's rivers and streams made from mercury, as well as mountains constructed from bronze. The tomb was also filled with replicas of royal buildings and statues of dancers, musicians, and acrobats. The idea here, much like we see in ancient Egypt, was to recreate life, recreate the emperor's life in the afterlife. The giant tomb complex which contained the emperor's body was protected by a terracotta army of 8,000 life-size soldiers and horses modeled in clay and distributed across three large pits. Each clay soldier has a unique facial expression demonstrating a high level of craftsmanship and artistry. Excavations reveal over 40,000 bronze weapons in this tomb complex, including battle axes, crossbows, arrowheads, and spears. 
Each of these 8,000 figures has a unique facial feature, as you can see here, and was likely painted to become highly decorative um, and colorful. In the first large pit surrounding the emperor's tomb, we see over 6,000 soldiers covered, and this tomb itself was covered by wooden beams and paved with over 250,000 ceramic tiles. These 6,000 infantrymen had crossbowmen, archers, charioteers, cavalry, cavalry as well as skirmishers. So you had different types of regiments represented within this first pit of 6,000 soldiers. The second pit contained cavalry and infantry units in particular within this kind of R-shaped area. Archaeologists to date have uncovered over 1,300 terracotta warriors and horses in this second pit and 80 war chariots like the one depicted behind me. The third pit surrounding the emperor's tomb contained high-ranking officers as well as chariots. The pit itself was actually shaped like the command post in during the emperor's life and contained 68 high-ranking officers. One of the major questions that archaeologists have debated about these fascinating terracotta warriors is were they all actually made in China? The terracotta statues found in Xi'an actually don't resemble anything else that we see in China from prior periods or later which really raises the question, how did these artists come up with the idea to make this type of statue to begin with? Some archeologists theorize that the inspiration for this terracotta army may have come from foreign artists. Particularly, there's evidence for Greek influence seen in bronze figures of ducks, swans, and cranes discovered within the royal tomb complex in Xi'an. There's also some evidence of European DNA in skeletons recovered at other sites in the region. Finally, there's also evidence, archival evidence, of exchange between ancient Greece and China after Alexander the Great's conquest of India in 326 BC. The archaeologists hypothesized that Greek people traveled to China and actually trained local craftsmen who then furnished the emperor's tomb with Greek-influenced terracotta warriors. Much like the Zhao and Shang dynasty before it, the Qing dynasty was not to last forever. Emperor Zhang was seceded after, after his death in 210 BC. Emperor Zhang was seceded by his son Hu Hai, who faced a series of uprisings and rebel alliances. The entire imperial house was massacred in 206 BC. There was also contention between the Chu and Han families for supremacy of the region following this massacre. By 202 BC, the Han had emerged from this conflict victorious and began the next series of empires in China, the Han Dynasty. All right, so in our next and last module, module five, we're gonna shift to the new world and talk about some of these complex societies in North and South America. See you then.